Hi, George. Hello, Nikita. Welcome. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? Just fine. Welcome back to Meaning of Life uh, TV. Uh, I'm really excited that we're we're having this conversation again, and uh, I'm saying again for any of our listeners because we have recorded one episode where we uh, talked about we gave kind of an overview of what Russian cosmism is, which is this peculiar uh, school of philosophical thought in the Russian tradition, and. That time we, like, we're, we're going to continue this conversation today. And that time we kind of jumped around from one thinker to another, trying to uh, show what they have in common, what makes them belong to this one uh, school of thought. Today we decided to have a little bit more of a narrow focus, which hopefully would get us, would allow us to go deeper into the actual ideas. And we uh, wanted to talk about Vladimir Solovyov and Nikolai Fedorov, the two, one of, well, Fedorov is like the founding figure of this, of this uh, movement. And then Solovyov is one of the um, more noticeable philosophers, writers, and poets, and just figures in the Russian literary tradition. So we're going to talk about those two. Um, but uh, I wanted to start kind of uh, in a more basic place. So we're, we're, we we talked in in the previous conversation about the creation of this uh, this um, term cosmism, but maybe we should start even earlier than that and talk about Russian philosophy in general because I know that there's a notion popular even in Russia itself uh, that or maybe not popular but at least you know it exists. Uh, and that's the idea that Russia doesn't actually have a philosophical tradition to speak of. There is no philosophy as like a discrete particular discipline. And most of the time, people who we know as Russian philosophers kind of double as the great Russian writer or a poet or a scientist or somebody else. So can you talk about that a little bit? What What is your uh, take on this? Do, do you consider Russia to have a philosophical tradition or is it a slightly different beast than what we know in uh, the Western tradition? I think it is something different and special, uh, u- <clears throat> unique perhaps to Russia. Uh, I think that it mostly developed in the 19th century. And so <clears throat> in Russian history and Russian culture, Russia had not gone through many of the same stages that Western history, the Western countries had gone through. And for example, the whole scientific revolution Mm -hmm. and period of rationalism had not been a native part of Russian thought. So when in the 18th and 19th century, Russia began to work in a more rational or at least to adopt more rational tools for looking at themselves. One of the things they wanted to examine was what have we contributed and how does our history of thought and of feeling or especially our history of our thought uh, differ from and share at the same time share with Western philosophy. And so that was the big consideration. And one of the first people to articulate it in a philosophical way was Chadayev in the early 19th century, a, uh, a contemporary of Pushkin. And he asked the question, what have we as Russians contributed to the history of culture uh, in, in the world? And his fear was that Russia had not presented anything positive that it had presented only a negative mm-hmm. example of how a civilization ought not to develop. So this was kind of a, a red flag thrown out, and people began to debate it very seriously. And I, think, so, I think it is still an it, ongoing debate within the Russian culture, well, just on so, the everyday so, level uh, as well. The classic division was between what they call the Slavophiles and the Westernists, Mm -hmm. Uh, in the 1830s and 1840s, where they debated what Russia had to offer the rest of the world, uh, what Russia had to take 
in thought, philosophy, and culture from the Western world. And so the Westerners emphasized the things that Russia should be taking from the West, institutions, uh, policies, government policies, ideas, and so forth, whereas the Slavophiles took the other side. They argued what Russia should be giving out to the rest of the world, that certain things in Russia were unique and valuable to be treasured and not to be dismissed. And so this is what is important. Now, when the cosmos eventually came along, Fyodorov and Solovyov tried to synthesize the two Mm -hmm. to say, yes, there are things we need to bring in from the West, but there are also features of Russian society, Russian culture that are too valuable to throw out and that we should be sharing with the rest of the world. And so uh, both Solovyov and Fyodorov had that idea that they could synthesize with their philosophies, their bodies of thought, this whole dichotomy between the Westerners and the Slavophiles. I think, as you said, the argument is still going on uh, even today. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something that the, that the cosmos, especially Fyodorov and Solovyov, tried to at least come to terms with. But how successful they were, we don't know. Yeah, and still, since still then, up. since their time, you know, we had a century of uh, the the communist or socialist experiment, which made this disagreement like put it on a different level. There, it's like it's the same spiral of thought, but you get onto the, on the next level of spiral and of the spiral, and people, you know. Uh, a lot of people in Russia think that the 20th century was just a cursed century and uh, we really did prove that idea that Russia has nothing except for uh, bad examples to show to the world. And then, of course, other people uh, have the opposite view and, and, and look at, at the 20th century with a certain kind of nostalgia. Um can you tell me how you got into this? Because you started, uh, as far as I understand, you mentioned in the, in the previous conversation that you went to the Soviet Union uh, in the, what was, 60s or 70s? First time was in 1968. Then in 1972 and I think 75 also, or 76 one, I went back. Uh, but at that time, I was a, a, a teacher of Russian literature and uh, of the language in universities in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I took groups of students, 30 at a time, as part of a larger group of 150 at a time, to what was then uh, Leningrad State University Mm -hmm. to study the language and the culture for uh, summer programs. And we spent 10 weeks in Leningrad and then traveled to Moscow and uh, also to places like uh, uh, Tbilisi or Yerevan uh, in order which to see now, other... Which are now part, not parts of Russia. Yeah. Well, they were not exactly. ever parts of Russia. That, that was Georgia and Armenia, respectively. Uh, but they were but, parts of the Soviet Union yeah. at that time. Yeah. So uh, we, we uh, I was just here with students, in Russia with students at that time. And while the students were in class... I sometimes went to the library at the Academia Nauk in uh, Leningrad and did work on Fyodorov and the Cosmos. And uh, it was a a very interesting time. And I recently, well, not recently, but maybe eight or nine years ago, went back to Moscow and to St. Petersburg uh, to, I gave a talk at uh, one of the conferences in um, Moscow. And it was a, a totally different, different experience in different country. I would uh, imagine exactly. That. Sure. Yeah. So from 1968 to 2008 or whatever it was, 40 years, uh, it was another world, a different world entirely. So was that uh, was uh, the time of your trips to the Soviet Union uh, when you discovered Fedorov and and others of these thinkers? No. Or no? Well, I was graduate school in the United States, mm-hmm. I was in a, a seminar on Dostoevsky. Mm-hmm. So I came to Russian philosophy through the literature, through, I was a student of Russian literature uh, in graduate school. Which and I, I guess this illustrates the point we were trying to make, right? That 
this is what Russian philosophy often is, right? People talk about Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, who most yes. people would not put in the philosopher's basket, but rather writer, fiction writers. Exactly. Yes, that's one of the special things about Russian philosophy or the Russian, I prefer just to call it uh, the Russian train of thought mm -hmm. rather than try to defend it as a special kind of philosophy in the German, French, British context. It doesn't fit in there, I don't think. But it's something, it is something special, a train of thought, of important thought, uh, existential thought. So I think that uh, I learned it, I, I came to it through my study of Dostoevsky, uh, wrote a paper on Dostoevsky and Fyodorov uh, that I was assigned. I had no idea who Fyodorov was, but my name was last in the alphabet in our class, so all the good topics and the <laughs> things that I was interested in had been taken by the time they came to me, and uh, on the list left was Fyodorov. So I took Fyodorov and uh, looked up something about him and just found a, a footnote in Dalinin's um, edition of Dostoevsky's letters about Fyodorov. And I looked at that footnote and thought, this is a big idea. This is an interesting idea. And so I've uh, con continued to study that from then till now, over 40 years. And you said that you didn't know what uh, who Fyodorov was. That's true of Dostoevsky himself as, as well, right? Because he uh, uh, learned about his ideas as like in somebody else's rendition. Is that right? Yes, it was his. It was uh, Fyodorov's one of his first followers and disciples, uh, Peterson, who tried to he tried to convince Fyodorov to publish his works, and Fyodorov was very reluctant to do so because he thought that they were not mature yet. He hadn't figured things out quite. And he wanted it to be much more polished and final mm -hmm. uh, than, than, than he, had, he had reached at that point. But Peterson went ahead and sent a whole uh, essay based on Fyodorov's ideas to Dostoevsky and didn't mention Fyodorov's name. It was just an anonymous thinker. And Dostoevsky was intrigued. He uh, said that these ideas are very much like my own ideas uh, and that I could uh, had sh shared them with my young friend, the philosopher Vladimir Solovyov. And we talked about them for hours and hours, he said. And so people who study Dostoevsky's work have found traces of Fyodorov's ideas in the brothers Karamazov and uh, also, of course, in the philosophy of Solovyov. And Dostoevsky died before any possibility of a meeting with Fyodorov, mm -hmm. or even before he could learn of Fyodorov's name. name. But uh, Solovyov and Fyodorov had many meetings over the years and uh, exchanges of letters. So they knew each other. They were personally acquainted, as well as just knowing each other's uh, thoughts. So uh, let's get into Fyodorov's ideas in a moment. But first, maybe we should... Uh draw like with with you know broad uh, strokes paint a little picture of who Fyodorov was because he's like when you read uh descriptions of the man they sound almost mythological like this is like moscow socrates a man who sleeps yes. in a room that is no bigger than a closet he only eats black bread and then he only drinks tea yes. doesn't have any money he uh Whatever money he does earn, he gives to others. Uh, a very peculiar character. So, can you talk a little bit about his his background? So, he's born in a he's an illegitimate son, right? Correct. He was an illegitimate son of a prince in the Gagarin family, and which is so also an, an interesting up. rhyme because Gagarin was an the first person to go to first person in space. Yes. Yeah. I don't know whether there was a connection, whether Yuri Gagarin can trace his ancestors back to that particular branch of the Gagarin line or not, but uh, it's an interesting turn anyway. But uh, the Gagarins that Fyodorov was born into, it was a, a, a princely family, very distinguished. The grandfather was one of the important people at the time of Catherine the Great. G uh, 
Fyodor's father was kind of a black sheep of that family. Mm. He was a, uh, it seems from the little that's, that's written about him, it seems that he was kind of a uh, bohemian character. He liked uh, the theater, and he liked the actresses in the theater, <laughs> and he liked to, uh, to show productions that were sometimes just pure entertainment, sometimes trash, sometimes uh, great drama. He would show Shakespeare or Moliere one week and a burlesque show the next week. Hmm. It, was, uh, it was a mixture of things. And so uh, he uh, fathered Fyodorov and two other children that we know of with this woman who's almost unknown. His, her name is known, but nothing else about her. Uh, but then he had another illegitimate family by another woman, and then he had a legitimate family that uh, lived on. So he was uh, an interesting person, but uh, Fyodor then always felt himself both an insider and an outsider. Mm -hmm. That is, he, was, he knew that he was a Gagarin, but at the same time, not a Gagarin. And so he uh, had to leave the family household uh, with his mother and brothers and sisters, sisters at some point later on, uh, early in his, his childhood, and grow up in uh, strange circumstances. He did go to, he was given a, a decent education for the time, and, uh, but he was kind of an odd person from the start. He w worked as a teacher uh, of elementary schools in provincial Russia, one town after another, never staying long in one place. Apparently he would he was loved by his pupils for his ex eccentricities and his experimental teaching methods, but was considered kind of a, a crank and an eccentric by the his superiors and got into trouble many times, uh, almost lost his job. So he was a, a wandering village schoolmaster who was strange. And then when he went to the library, he became a legendary librarian. He was the man who would bring the books to people. So that's already in, in Moscow. Moscow. Mm -hmm. That's in Moscow, yeah, in the 1860s. Through the 50s, he was a, a, a teacher mm -hmm. in provincial Russia. Then in the 1860s, later, uh, about 1867 or 68, he went to Moscow and got a job in a library. And he was a uh, legendary as a very helpful librarian. If uh, somebody was working on a topic and ordered some books on there, Fyodor would bring them many more, more books than they had ordered, and there would be materials that they didn't know existed, but were totally relevant to whatever they were studying. So Fyodor became kind of a, a uh, uh, an ideal librarian, as one of the people uh, wrote in an obituary to him. So a lot of people knew him as a librarian, but nobody, almost nobody, also knew that he was a thinker and that he had his own philosophy. There were just a handful of people who did, knew that. Uh, but he was a very eccentric character. He, Tolstoy admired him. Tolstoy got to know him and admire him because for, to Tolstoy, Fyodor was one of the rare people in life who lived exactly according to his ideals. That is, he, he was a vegetarian, he didn't eat meat. Tolstoy tried to be a vegetarian, but somehow, sometimes uh, lapsed. Uh, Fyodor was totally uh, chaste. Tolstoy believed in chastity, but also failed mm -hmm. himself many times. And so for Tolstoy, Fyodor was a person who actually lived what he believed. And he believed in giving away everything. So sure enough, he gave away everything that uh, that he had, and that people tried to to uh, get, to give to him. So he was uh, an eccentric character. It's but, funny. Uh, it's funny that the this relationship between Tolstoy and Fyodorov was not uh, exactly equal in this regard, right? Because while Tolstoy, like in the later years of his life, was so enamored by this. Uh, seemingly saintly man 
the seemingly saintly man in response thought that Tolstoy used to be a great writer. Now he turned into a bad philosopher. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That uh, they would argue uh, Tolstoy would come into the library and people were amused to see here was the writer of War and Peace and Anna Karenina, the, the greatest Russian writer living at the time. And Fyodor would be treating him like a, a, a bad schoolboy. Would be they'd be walking along, and and Tolstoy would try to please Fyodor by bringing up ideas or suggestions or, or thoughts that uh, that weren't characteristic of Tolstoy. But he thought that Fyodor might it might win him some some points with Fyodor, and Fyodor would just shake his head and turn him turn turn away from him and and uh, scowl at him all the time. And he would tell Tolstoy to his face that he was a fool, mm -hmm. that he was an absolute fool. Who else would say that to Tolstoy? You know, but Fyodor did. And so uh, Tolstoy admired him and at one time said that if he didn't have his own philosophy, his own doctrines, he would have become a probably a, an acolyte of, of Nikolai Fyodorovich's uh, thoughts. So he he thought he was a he didn't like the idea of technical. Uh, Fyodor's technological paradise, uh, but he thought that Fyodor's passion for his idea and the need for his social ideas very much appealed to, to Tolstoy. And this is all happening in and around the library? And around the library, but also at Tolstoy's Moscow house. Mm -hmm. uh, Tolstoy first met, first met Solovyov, uh, at a meeting at Tolstoy's house. Tolstoy, uh, Fyodorov came to Tolstoy's Moscow house many times, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they would just have a, uh, conversations. People, other people would be there, Solovyov, uh, Strakov would be there, and other, other thinkers and uh, writers, musicians, and so forth would be there. It was part of Tolstoy's, he was one of the guests at Tolstoy's evening uh, gatherings sometimes for, for serious conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I I brought up the library because my understanding, my, my impression that I got from your book and from some other uh, writings is that library library became kind of an archetypical form for him as a like this is what we should be building these these centers of sort of self education where knowledge yes. is free. He was, is he like one of the early, uh, earliest uh, enemies of copyright laws? Because I was, I was amused was. to, to, to sure. see that, that the notions that are now, uh, you know, passionately believed by like the pirate party or like the, the hacker community yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, were, were so a, a major hacker. point of, of his worldview, right? It's, he, he had like some phrase yes. that to... I'm going to butcher this, I'm going to misquote it, but he had some notion that uh, to, to have an idea that words can belong to somebody is to misunderstand the whole point of, of what knowledge is and what thought is. Exactly, that it has to be shared. And that his, one of his great points was that the a more serious division in the world than rich and poor was those who had knowledge and mm -hmm. those who did not have knowledge. And so the learned and the ignorant, uh, that was the greatest division in the world. So the job of the learned uh, should not be to pursue further learning for themselves or for the sake of knowledge, but to, to share uh, the, their knowledge, their insights, their work, intellectual work with those who had the desire, but not the knowledge, not the background, not the ability at the moment to pursue those tasks. So he would he said that often the the learned had the information, had the knowledge, but not the will to bring about the necessary changes. The poor and the uh, unlearned had the desire, but not the knowledge, not the intellectual skills. So we needed to share those things so that knowledge should be of everything for everyone and that we would all share in the whole project of knowledge. So that's that was his 
I, his use of the library was to see if, uh, if people could share important knowledge freely. Uh, he called, he was an early advocate for exchanges uh, between libraries, between the French library and the, and the Russian library. Uh, he was one of the early ones to, to uh, try to get a card catalog set up. So that uh, so that people could look into the cards and find out what uh, uh, what holdings there were in the library, mm -hmm. and then also not only what the title of something, but a description of what it was all about, so that they could e each item uh, they could understand what e each item was about. He would love today's internet, where you know you could, it's free access for everybody for just about anything that you can find. So he was that uh, that kind of of person. That was his attitude toward knowledge, and he believed that that in the future universities and all these institutions should be replaced by a single institution that he called a uh, a museum uh, church or a museum temple that would be engaged in the acquisition, but also the practical application. Of knowledge in every in every way so it's like a like a cultural center that can you can you yes. can you, like flesh out what what this church museum is would be yes he said that museums should not just be uh, places where people collect and view dead objects mm -hmm. that a museum should be a living have li living tableaus of things from the past uh, and that it should be the, the, the uh, devoted to the single task of eventually resurrecting all the dead. So it should be the, the accumulation of all things that would be relevant to uh -huh. the resurrection. So, uh, you know, little bits of this and that uh, that might uh, give us an idea about somebody who lived a hundred years ago, anything. I know Tolstoy once was walking through the library with Fyodorov and looked at some little book, a list of kernels from such and such a division, you know, 80 years before or something like that, just a list. And he said, there's so much trash in here that should just be burned. And Fyodorov just looked at him and said, I've seen many, heard many in, ignorant people in the, in the world Lev Nikolaevich, but never one like that, you know, that you were one time a brilliant writer, but now that was when you were a, a brilliant writer, but now you're a, a stupid philosopher. And he was, and he so, was very much uh, opposed to the, like, his, it, it seems that like his passion is to not let anything perish, right? Every, not, not, let, not, not it, just it, the, sorry, go ahead. Correct. Any little trace that can bring us to, uh, that can reveal something about one of our ancestors mm -hmm. must be preserved because whole individuals can eventually be recreated from the single trace. So the idea, it's almost like a clone. You take one little piece of something and recreate a, a whole person from that little piece, whether it's a a piece of writing, or it's a, a, a particle of and what he called ancestral dust, mm -hmm. uh, that science eventually will find a way to do that. We can't do it now. Uh, he didn't foresee it in his in the immediate future at all. But at some point, science will be able to uh, to, to do that to create recreate whole people from little particles. So let's uh, start our. I want to get to this idea, the, his big idea of resurrecting the dead and, and how it relates to uh, Christianity and how it relates to uh, all of the rest of his work. Uh, but I want to like get there through his philosophy, through like build up a picture of what the world is for him at first and then get to so that it doesn't like this is a, a big idea. This is like between. Sure out there and far out right this isn't you don't want to jump yes, to that you know like you yeah. would in a swimming pool so um i i think uh, it, it would make 
makes sense to start with this notion of kinship that uh, was very important for him. And I have a quote here. Um, this is from uh, his diary or a letter um, that, that you quote in the book. So he is um, talking about his childhood and he says, from the years of childhood, three memories remain clear to me. I saw black, very black bread on which I heard people say the peasants fed in what was probably some year of famine. From childhood, I heard an explanation of war to my question about it that put me into terrible confusion. In war, people shoot each other. And finally, I learned that some people are not one's kin, but strangers. And even among one's kin, some are not kin, but strangers. So uh, this in relation to his childhood, that, uh, uh, that this kinship issue uh, is a particularly easily, easily uh, understandable uh, sort of, you know, everyday down to earth meaning of that word. He was a Gagarin, as you said, but he also wasn't a Gagarin. He was a legitimate son. And that seems to be like a, a, an issue for him early on. But it relates yes. to his life. But it relates to bigger. So he develops this idea of kinship. And I, I'm not sure I understand all of this well. But the, the way I, uh, uh, the way I, I, I understood it is not only he thinks that all humans are akin to each other, which is, you know, again, doesn't take much to explain. We do have common ancestors. Every human, you know, comes from a, 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 some ape or whatever. And, 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 and this is a big issue for him. And, and the, the fact that people don't treat each other as skin is a big problem. And uh, a challenge is to realize our common nature and, and brotherly, sisterly nature. But as far as I understand, he extends this to kind of relationship between everything and everything else in the world. Like every particle right. is related to every particle in the world. The cosmos is right. is a, like a relative to the humankind and the, the planet is, like, everything is kinship. Is Everything that, is kinship. Is that not right? Only, not only, that's correct. That's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And not only kinship, but what is important is a special part of that kinship. That the French Revolution talked about brotherhood. Mm -hmm. But what Fuller talks about is sonship and daughterhood. That is that we must not only love our contemporaries and our equals, uh, our brothers, but we should especially love those from whom we took our life, our parents. Mm -hmm. And so kinship as a form of sonship, that is looking at yourself as a son of your fathers and your mothers and looking to your parents. Uh, and so giving time a vertical dimension as well as a horizontal mentioned looking not only at your contemporaries but at your past as well and that you carry within yourself elements of your of all your ancestors and so we have to consider not only immortality for the present for the present generation or the future generation but also go back and resurrect the ancestors that's part of his idea of kinship is Love for your parents, active love for your parents, your grandparents, etc., all the way back. Uh, so that is a kind of of uh, task that all humanity has if they're going to be moral. They can't just ignore their past in order to pursue the the present and the future. And so all the universe, Fyodor believed, is in part made up of little particles of our ancestors, of our disintegrated ancestors, mm -hmm. that matter never totally disappears from the universe. It just goes somewhere else, out in space or wherever. And so the task of humanity, that's why he wants to go exploring space, the task is to go out and recollect all those little particles of our ancestors 
and be able to put them together again into whole people to restore them to life. So that's part of what makes the universe one and why we are related to everything in the universe because everything we, we know and touch, all objects have particles of our ancestors in them. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a complicated idea and he says that that's why we should learn eventually to eat things other than not only meat and vegetables, that every time we eat a potato, we're eating something of our ancestor, mm -hmm. that we are cannibal, in other words. So we've got to uh, develop what he called the autotrophic uh, state, that is to live on sunlight and air uh, somehow in the, in the distant future. And Vernotsky also took up that idea later on, uh, that we will develop ways to feed ourselves, to nourish ourselves, that doesn't involve devouring our ancestors. So, Because right. uh, even, even a vegetable that grows in the, in the dirt <laughs> uses the minerals that came from exactly. other creatures who died somewhere that's, around. That's right. Is there, so we're related to everything. Would it be too far to extend this to non-living matter as well? Like I'm trying to get to this idea that everything is related to everything else, uh, that, 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 that every particle is akin to every other particle. And it, would it like fit his perspective that, you know, we can say that uh, we are made out of uh, particles left after the explosion of a star. Would that make us related to non-living matter uh, such as a star or, or whatever else in the, in the universe? Or is that, I, I, think I'm so. trying, I, I think I'm trying to wrap my head around, uh, you know, Federer's ideas and I'm, you know, I have a different background. I'm not, I was not brought up religiously and, and I want to get uh, in a little bit to this. He talked about the shame of birth and the uh, dread yes. of death. And that's also something I, uh, kind of struggle to relate to, but I have like a, an interpretation that would fit my worldview. So, uh, but, but, but on that point of interrelatedness of everything, is there, is it like a, a fundamental quality of matter of, of everything in the material world that everything does correspond to everything else to him? Not just. Yes, it is. And mm -hmm. therefore it has life as potential, mm -hmm. if not actual. Mm -hmm. uh, everything in the universe is potentially alive. And it's the human task to bring it all back into life, to somehow bring, to, to fulfill that life that is now, that now exists in potential everywhere and in everything in, in the universe. And so that is part of his religious idea, that his God, that the, the idea of the Holy Trinity for him is that there, it, it shows that more th that uh, three things can actually be unified mm -hmm. without losing their specificity, their individuality. Uh, so the idea of individual particles and uh, uniting without losing their individuality is something that uh, that he sees as the basis of his religion of his theology uh, so that's why it all fits together in Fyodorov and why Dostoevsky said he's the most logical thinker that he's ever run into that you give him one point and you next thing you know you you've got to resurrect the dead <laughs> so all of them, uh, you know it's it's all tied in together. And so the whole his idea of Orthodox Christianity is that Christ is the, uh, is the Son of God and the Son of Man together. Mm -hmm. So we should become Christ-like by becoming, recognizing ourselves as sons of our fathers as well as contemporaries and brothers. And so active love means bringing them back to life. So his, what is so unusual about Fyodorov and what 
is so, I guess, either off-putting or uh, interesting is the absolute literal quality of his thought and his imagination. If it's written in the Bible, he tries to make it literally true. So the idea of, of the resurrection of the, of the body or anything in there in, the, in theology cannot be viewed just as a figure of speech or as an idea. It has to be made literally true. And so the idea that we're all related has to be literally true, made true. And so you're, you're using uh, this uh, turn of phrase, it has to be made true. And this relates to how he viewed knowledge, right? His, yeah. uh, his, his idea is knowledge is neither subjective nor objective, but projective. And that well, in that, in the, so like take this idea of everything being interrelated. You can argue about it. You can say that that doesn't make any sense. There is, you know, there are no particles of our dead ancestors in the world, in in in, in the universe somewhere. Uh, or you can argue it is true. You can argue that on either a subjective or objective basis, like this is how I feel, or no, this is the actual truth, or this is in reality, this is false. His approach to knowledge generally is, we make reality a certain way and so his ideas that he outlines are not like something found i mean he does find it uh you know found he founds a lot of it in the bible and 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 knowledge beforehand but there is what he's proposing is what we make with the world what do you make out of the world as opposed to exactly. like an object like here's what i saw and this is a description of what it actually is right that's right. Yes. He says that that his epistemology, which he calls supramoralism. Supramoralism. Is, what does that mean? Uh, it means uh, beyond, <laughs> I don't know, it's what he means, but he calls it. <laughs> it's a label of him. Because he needs a label of some kind, sure. he has to put on it. On it. But uh, the idea is that uh, it's a bridge between any kind of between theory, theory and practice that the pra the theor theoretical um, uh, the theoretical mind theoretical imagination and the practical imagination mm -hmm. and so his projectivism is a way to make theory into practice so it's the activity it's an active kind of knowledge it's not a passive knowledge that we we receive something, we receive knowledge, uh, we receive impulses in some way. It's an active, an active participation, participation in knowledge. That's why he calls it a participation in knowledge uh, instead of a search for knowledge or something mm -hmm. like that. It's a participate, participatory uh, process. Okay, and so let's... Let's try to run with this kinship idea. So if you approach the idea that everything is related and have all humans are related and, and the world is related to humans, so forth and so on. And it's supposed to, like the Trinity is a good example. Like this is how the world is ought to be for Fyodorov, right? So on one level, you can say that uh, just the relationship between humans should be similar to the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That is each retains their individual individuality but we are one we are cons we, we view ourselves as as uh like a living organism made out of individual humans right correct yeah okay and so given this participatory approach how do we get there what 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 is the vision of the what is this world where everything becomes finally uh, uh, consciously related to everything else? And how do we get there? What is this this project of his to, to, to get there? Apart from, so we did talk about this kind of technical point of science might be able to give us immortality, like prolonged life. This is, 
you know, what scientists are working on. Google is, is, is trying to solve death now without any of the yep. religious, theological, or philosophical right. dimensions of that. It, it can be approached as a technical problem. Now, Fedorov goes further than that and suggests resurrecting the dead. But how does he view, how, did, how does he envision uh, this trinity-like unity of of everything in the world and in humans in the world manifest itself how does that happen first of all <clears throat> the trinity is the icon for the, uh, for the for the world that we ha must hold in our minds and in our hearts mm -hmm. that's the pro that's the goal of the church now is to it makes sure that everyone has this icon of the Trinity in their hearts and in their minds, uh, that we acquire that. Uh, and so from that, with that in mind, as that is our, if that is our guiding icon for all that we do and the way we test everything that we do, does it, does it match up to this icon of the Trinity? Uh, the idea that are we living according to this icon, our individual lives, that's part of it in the individual life, but it also is has to be a mass movement. This is one of the things that distinguishes Fyodor from Solovyov, is that for Fyodor, it has to be a, a universal project. Everybody has to be involved. Everybody has to do their part. And the only way we can do that is to have the, the autocrat leading the way with the Trinity. This is where I leave the, this is where I leave his train of thought. <laughs> right, this is, this is where, it, uh, where he loses a lot of people, uh -huh. is the idea uh -huh. that, that uh, the, uh, the autocrat, uh, and preferably a Russian autocrat, because sure. of the, the history of Russia uh, is, is uh, the history that, that is required for an autocratic leader so that uh, the autocrat will organize this grand project and create the institutions, the museum, uh, churches, the museum, temples around in every locality where people will work together uh, and will reform all present occupations, all present uh, ways of life toward this one grand ideal. So it has to be everybody in the world working toward one great ideal. And in Fyodor's idea, this will Christianize the world, no matter what your previous background, whether you're Muslim, Jewish, atheist, whatever you are, once you join this project, then you are resurrecting your parents, you're resurrecting the dead, you become a Christ-like figure in practice, regardless of what uh, what uh, confession you came from. So, so you, you, this might, is, you may uh, retain your your like uh, identity as a Muslim, but since the the proposed project is resurrecting the dead, which is what Christ is known for, what what, what Christianity yeah. is built around. Uh, yes. Then, in effect, you that's become a Christian. For Fyodor, if that's true Christianity, all the rest is is just uh, fluff. But that what? is the true Christ Christianity. Why is there? Why? The, uh, why? Why does it have to be an autocratic? Because uh, the reason I'm asking uh, is, in Solovyov, uh, who we'll get to in a little bit, uh, as I was reading, um, the meaning of love. He's, he's also outlining kind of, uh, he's describing in more mystical terms, there's no or, or very little technical uh, right. sort of notions there. But uh, he's also describing a vision of the world as it ought to be, and it is this interrelated uh, living thing uh, that my perception of, 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 of what he's describing seemed almost anarchic. Uh, in the sense that there, there's no institution to govern this thing. Every every little part approaches 
So like a human approaches his own society or his or her uh, society as uh, as a, a lover approaches a lover. That is like a, yes. your your identity is retained. You're not um, uh, you're not trying to force the society to be a certain way or first force a different person to be a certain way and you're not uh dominated into this relationship but it is this free open interplay uh between yes. humans and so that to me sounds like uh you know uh either either some sort of a communist utopia or an anarchist utopia where there is no state to govern and certainly no autocrat a, a single human to to uh right. govern so isn't there a contradiction with within fedorov's thought because he's also describing this inter in, interconnected and uh uh you know kinship and everything and isn't autocrat a person who forces their vision of the world on others or is it like a it's more sort of idealistic the utopian autocrat. vision of the autocrat it will be the ideal autocrat, not mm -hmm. the autocrats that we know in history, but the autocrat as he should be. Uh -huh. And the autocrat as he should be is will be the example. He it will be he will lead by example, and uh, people will see will understand the wisdom of his leadership. It will all be voluntary. Fyodor believes that. Once people realize what the task of all humanity is, then they will volunteer for it because it will be the most important thing in the world to restore life to their, their dead uh, mm -hmm. ancestors, their dead parents. And so if the autocrat is organizing society so that people can accomplish this ideal, this idea, this great goal, then they will voluntarily follow him, follow him, join him. But what's interesting too, the difference between Fyodorov and Solovyov is uh, Fyodorov uh, is, is projecting a father figure here mm. that is, uh, is well, a, a patriarchy. He, Fyodorov is, is really, he believes in, in the father, the great father. Whereas uh, Solovyov, is really it's the great mother. It's mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. it's the sense of of, of uh, Sophia, the divine feminine, whereas for Fyodorov it's the divine father. You know, so it's a different different way, a different emotional, I think, approach as well as a philosophical approach to the great problems of life here. And it shows how two people who have similar ideas and similar goals have very different ways of looking at those and of, of trying to go about them. That Fyodor, is, he, he hardly ever mentions uh, women or daughters. Right, it's all about sonship and fatherhood. Sonship, fatherhood. You have the, the fathers and the, the czar who stands in the father place. Uh -huh. And what, the, what that means is, for Fyodor, is that Russia had acquired the Pamir mountain range, and the Pamirs was a holy mountain for humanity uh, in Fyodor's mythology. He believed that, that just as in Hindu mythology or Tibetan, that all points, uh, everything points toward a central mountain that is the path between heaven and earth, or the... the uh, that rises up to heaven from earth, that that was the Pamir Mountains for Fyodor. Mm -hmm. And that he believed that, uh, that Adam's bones were, the original Adam's bones were buried under the, the Pamir Mountains. And strange, strange thoughts uh, <laughs> based on local legends there, local Muslim legends about Adam being buried in, in the Pamirs. But uh, anyway, the, because Russia had acquired the Pamir mountain range through some kind of treaty or other, uh, the czar now stood in the father place in Pamir, uh -huh. in the Pamir mountain. Uh, so that made him, uh, that's another reason why it had to be the Russian czar instead of the 
British king or the you know the the Raja of of India to lead the the whole project, the whole uh, resurrection project. Do we have a so sense of do we have a sense of how he uh, felt about the actual Tsar at the time or the previous autocrats of, of Russia? Is he like not very critical of, of like the actual I think he, government? I think he was not very critical. Mm -hmm. Not very critical that uh, he he didn't believe that any of the previous Tsars or the present Tsar was ideal mm -hmm. at all. That the the whole world is is just a uh, falling apart. Uh, that nature is the force of disintegration, and that the human task is to reintegrate everything that nature will disintegrate uh, through its force. And so uh, death is a kind of final disintegration, and that's how we overcome death, is to reunite everything that death, that nature is trying to destroy. So the present czars are part of the, of the uh, present and past czars were just a reflection of the natural world which was uh, and driving the social disintegration, uh, and that every individual is disintegrating as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the different parts of our being are separating emotion from uh, reason and all of these different facets of our personality, instead of working together, are working against each other. So that was true in the in the czars in history as well as in the, as uh, peasants in history. Everybody. I had that same kind of thing, but in the future, the, the ideals are the czar as he ought to be will be different. Sure, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so uh, before I, I want to uh, soon start talking about the difference to uh, uh, to the idea of uh, the different approaches to the idea of resurrection uh, between Solovyov and Fyodorov. But first, let's stop for a second on that notion that I brought up of shame of birth and dread of death so again to me that might be a little difficult to relate to maybe because of you know i was brought up by good uh, soviet citizens who were, had no relation to the to the religious side of life and um, never saw anything shameful in the sense in in the in being born but if I understand the here's like my narrative that I superimpose on what I read in Fyodorov to make sense out of it is the idea that um, birth and death are, are are kind of two sides of the same coin it, the, the the dread of death is well on a personal level it's familiar to everybody nobody wants to die but uh, to Fyodorov it's maybe more fundamental issue of um, you know, there's like this struggle between between existence and non-existence and between uh, spirit and lack of spirit and so forth. And then birth is shameful because the very idea of like natural selection is creatures give birth to the next generation and then die out. This is the, the method of, of uh, sort of developing whatever we are. And so if you have the idea of birth that is only there as a part of this larger approach to the situation that involves death of your parents yes does that make is that too much am i bending him to to make fit my own uh thinking or is no i think that he what he objects to is the force of nature working in us mm -hmm. that is the sex drive Mm -hmm. that drives males and females to leave their parents and to seek to become parents themselves, uh, to take the life from their parents to, in order to try to recreate new life through the act of sexual intercourse. So that's what's wrong, well, partly is the shame of birth, is the idea that we abandon our parents, we have abandoned our parents in order to become parents ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we perpetuate this natural cycle, this dominance of nature over 
our other sides, uh, human sides, over our will, over our uh, love, uh, that nature, we are just acting the same way animals, other animals act, instead of trying to overcome that animal nature, uh, overcome the force of nature that dominates the lower life, uh, and to do something that is higher than that in Fyodor's idea. So that's part of the shame, is that we relinquish our humanity, our reason, our true sense of love for our parents, in order to uh, become creatures of natural passion and lust. Okay, and so it's all. This is also one of the points of departure between Solovyov and Fyodorov, right? Because exactly. for Solovyov, sexuality exactly. is actually kind it, of the way it, to this this great uh, yes. world is about to mm -hmm. be. So. Um, yes. To try to sum it up, well, maybe maybe a, a good way to segue into Solovyov. Um, Fyodorov is big on these technical um, uh, propositions. Here's how we get to the ideal world, and 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 there's is chastity a part of that as well. We, we're supposed to yes. give up our yes. sexual drive. Okay, so that's that. As, as we, we as we proceed toward the idea of immortality and resurrection, mm -hmm. there will be no more birth, uh, no more sexuality, that everybody will be acting as, identifying themselves as sons and daughters mm -hmm. instead of as uh, potential partners, mm -hmm. sexual partners. And this is kind of like the exact opposite of what Solyov is suggesting. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay, so there's this sonhood uh, yep. relation to the world. Then there's immortality in the very literal sense of that word. Science yes. is to find a way for humans not to die anymore. And then yes. resurrection of the dead, also by scientific means. We find whatever particles uh, we can find of uh, our ancestors. Uh, try to get DNA and clone them basically into physical material beings and and it proceeds with these waves uh, of so we resurrect our parents then they resurrect their parents and they resurrect their parents and it goes all the way it, does it stop anywhere is it like that's one of the questions is where do you draw the line between the first human and the last ape yeah uh, do Does we he, I mean, should we resurrect all the apes as well, and then the, the creatures that came before? He doesn't answer that. He doesn't address that question. Okay. That's one of the problems that Solovyov brings up, is what do you do when you come to cannibals? Do you want to resurrect a cannibal? Uh, do you want to resurrect a, a terrible person, a murderer mm -hmm. from the past? How do you make sure that that person is not resurrected as a, as a future murderer or something mm -hmm. like that? So... And then animals. What do we do with the animals? How so, far back do you want to go? And 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 the this example of of, of resurrecting a murderous person is one sort of uh, issue with this. But more broadly speaking, Solovyov objects, and I also don't grasp how this physical resurrection of everybody leads to a, an ideal world. So we let's give it let, 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 if we entertain this as a kind of like science fiction scenario. Yes, this would not be a, a utopian science science fiction movie if if it was filmed. You know, like we everybody is alive, so we have all of these. I don't know what the numbers would be. Why why would we start? Um, like how from this technical, uh, or not technical, but like. Uh, Oh, let, let, let's keep technical as a word. But from this, this project of here's what we do, how do we get to uh, this religious, spiritual utopia of, of um, 
equal love and 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 all of these beautiful other things that is something that he doesn't really answer mm -hmm. because uh, he talks about the idea of resurrection once once the dead are resurrected then we will have all knowledge we will be omnip omniscient because Anything we want to know, we can ask somebody who lived, you know, a million years ago and find out about it. Uh, we can anything. Right, so we're resurrecting we, we, them with their memory intact somehow. With their memory intact mm -hmm. somehow, with their identity intact. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you know, it's it's just not clear. That's one of the things in Fyodor that's just not at all clear, is why. Would it, will it be an ideal society if everybody who ever lived lives again? Why is that an ideal society? And I think that uh, that Solovyov didn't uh, didn't see the answer to that in Fyodorov's mm -hmm. part, in Fyodorov's idea, in Fyodorov's project. And so he uh, was trying to work on that in a different way on his own. So but looks, I think that that's uh, mm -hmm. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I I think that that's uh, something that is one of the one of the defects of of Fyodorov's whole system is that uh, it's not clear why. First of all, Fyodorov claims to know what death is, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people say we don't know what death is. We don't know whether death may be something that is is uh, a, an important part of universal life. We don't know that. Uh, Fyodor says we do know that death is a, is a it is a bad thing, mm -hmm. and we must overcome it. And it seems That's that this whole problem. his whole worldview or all of these projects they come from. It, it's not that he. It's more that he sees a problem with the current state of the world than he has a clear vision of what the world to that it, as it ought to be is, right? Yes. He he's very strong on it's just not okay that death exists. And it's like yes. to him it's an obvious issue with our reality that we need to start working on pronto. Yes. And then exactly. from there everything else sort of follows okay yeah okay that's that's good now um Solovyov uh has a different approach they so Solovyov first we should establish the link Solovyov and Fyodorov um well you said that 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 Solovyov read his writings at first uh then they met uh, he early on he actually even even refers to Fyodorov as a teacher, and uh, yes, his teacher. Yes. So there is a certain reverence there, and he's in, in, influenced by his ideas. Um, and then they even start or attempt to start a kind of a collaboration, where uh, yes. this, this project of resurrection. Um, they try to present it to well, it never happens, right? They never do present it to the uh, sort of larger society. I think they both felt they realized that Fyodor was not a great writer mm -hmm. in a the sense of being able to state clearly and uh, coherently, cogently his ideas. He rambles a lot in his writing, and people have criticized him as being a terrible writer. Solovyov was a great writer. And so probably they both agreed that Solovyov could explain the idea much more persuasively and much more clearly than Fyodorov or Fyodorov's disciples could. And so Solovyov was to be the spokesman mm -hmm. for the idea that they held jointly, supposedly. Uh, it turns out that they didn't really agree, right. even when they thought that they did. Uh, but Solovyov was going to present Fyodorov's idea to the public 
at an important lecture in Moscow in 1891. And he did give this talk, but, uh, and as people said, it produced the, uh, a bombshell effect on Russian intellectual uh, life at that time. Uh, but Fyodorov thought that he didn't go far enough, whereas the people who heard it thought that it was just going way too far mm -hmm. for anything. But for Fyodorov, it didn't go far enough, and it didn't specify anything about the way to achieve immortality or resurrection, nothing in science or any of that. It was all just vague rhetoric mm -hmm. instead of specific proposals. So Fyodorov is about specific proposals in every little detail. Uh, so the uh, they didn't really, they weren't able to, to uh, work together, though they tried, and it, it did, nothing came of it. Uh, and then Solovyov used some of these ideas to develop uh, his own, in his own direction. Uh, he retained the idea of the importance of resurrection, but it became a part of his system instead of trying to fit it, to ex, uh, ex, explain it and extend it within Fyodorov's system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's try to do the same thing with Solovyov as we did with Fyodorov, that is to <clears> get to the idea of resurrection, but through his worldview generally. Um, so there is this um, major work of his called The Meaning of Love. And yes. it starts with, like with Fyodorov, I guess, with a diagnosis of the, of the current situation. Uh, yes. But his diagnosis is more... Um, metaphysical or something. I don't know what, what word to choose. But he speaks of this uh, nature, um, this quality of reality as we know it, uh, that gives, uh, that, that makes it impossible for uh, the meaning of love to actually manifest itself. And that quality yes. is what he calls double impenetrability. That is, yes. Uh, double because it, it it exists in space and in time. So uh, in 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 simple words, every moment exists at the expense of the previous moment for for now to exist. Past yes. had to disappear, and then same thing is true about spatial uh, dimension. Two physical bodies cannot occupy the same space, and yes. because of that, the the and I guess so the love that he speaks of, romantic love, sexual love, to him is kind of the uh, the desire for this to not be the case. There is a, a drive for unity, a drive for the, the other person becomes everything to you, you become everything to them, and you become like united and you, you become an entity that cannot, you, you, you can't, in this physical world, you cannot have two people be the same person. You can't have right. two whatever be the same thing if, if, if they're not the same thing to begin with. Um, so that's, it, this is the correct rendition, right? Yes. Okay. And from that, uh, he tries to find the meaning of love, uh, the love that, as we know, sexual love, not, not sonhood or, 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 or this ancestral dimension that Fedor speaks of. Uh, he sees the meaning of love in, it's like a, it's like a precursor to that uh, ideal world where everything is connected and free and uh, <clears throat> related to everything else without um, uh, abusing, I'm, I'm, I'm missing some English words here, without, without forcing uh, the world or other people or everything, the other, whatever it is, the, the, the interplay between an individual and, and everything else is supposed to be this drive for unity without trying to force unity on the other. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, yes it, it comes from the old formula, the uh, the orthodox religious formula, as as, as stated by the um, by the <clears throat> Slavophiles, the idea of subordinate and the idea of uh, of 
a unity that is neither forced nor uh, nor able to separate. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is is that it's a, a a holy unity, a sacred unity, that uh, that humans in the physical uniting, the act of physically uniting, are in a way striving toward this spiritual unity that will be more real uh, as humanity evolves and will become more real as humanity evolves because he says that this is this is again his idea of Christ that Christ is to humanity the uh, the idea of immort as the idea of immortality is to mortality. That is, humans are striving toward the ideal of immortality, the way animals, the rest of the animal kingdom, is striving, evolving toward reason. Mm -hmm. So, Christ is the image, the icon of immortality for us, just as a man is the sort of the icon of of reason for an animal, for a beast. That uh, And so we are gradually, maybe over 10,000 years, evolving toward that. We don't have to force it. It will come. Uh, mm -hmm. But it will come not by, through an autocrat, but through uh, the example of those who have intuited the truth, poets, Seers, uh, visionaries, mystics have had visions of this great unity. And the realization of those visions will come gradually as people, more and more people share that kind of, of vision and uh, shape their lives toward that kind of vision. So it will be kind of a... a uh, by example, by ex the example of the mystics, the seers, and the poets, instead of by the authority of the of the autocrat and the scientists. We, yeah, mm -hmm. and the scientists, right? Yeah, yeah, no science here. Yeah, yeah. and, so and is, is it he gives? I was again trying to wrap my head around uh, what this. Um, what this world where uh, two things can coexist at the same time and occupy the same space could be. And there is one example that he gives that uh, if that's what he means, then I understand what he's talking about. He's talking about um, sort of the relationship between the society and the individual. And he says that here is an example of two things coexisting at the same time occupying the exact same space. I live, you know, within my whatever village, town, city, uh, country. I am a part of this human collectivity. Yes. And there's uh, actually kind of no way uh, outside of that. Humans are social animals. We, we do, uh, the, the, the human collectivity exists at the same time as the human individual. And both require the other both are in they they are in a in in a in a some sort of an interplay and uh and i guess that you know our our social struggles come from this uh conflict between them where do we how do we uh draw the lines between personal freedoms and rights and um you know the just the sanctity of personal life and the interests of the society at large and so for him if we imagine a society where these things are kind of worked out and humans exist in part for the society where they live, and the society exists for the humans that it is made of, this is this vision of uh, interconnectedness and... and, 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 and what? I'm, I'm losing the words here. Yeah. Okay, but, so no, for, but, but, but again, for Solovyov, this like what I just described is kind of a pedestrian example because apart from the 
this like easily understandable dimension of what I am and how I relate to other humans. This is like a, a one dimension, but but the same principles operate in the universe at large, right? Again, every yep. particle, every everything is related to everything else, and everything is supposed to get to that state where everything exists for everything else. Yes. Can you try to so. ex expand on this so that I, like, I say these things and I like, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not fully yet. Uh, I haven't captured that that fully yet. I think one of the things that Solovyov <clears throat> is saying is the idea that, uh, well, he, he, his ideal is an ideal androgyny. That is that we are both male and female and that uh, eventually, like Fyodorov, we will not have childbirth, we will not have death, we will have, we will all live uh, as an androgynous kind of existence, that is both male and female, and that the, uh, the differences will be incorporated into one personality, so that we will be both male and female, but still one person. And this is and not so, this is not like metaphorical. I, I'm I'm tempted to try to come up with like you can look at let's say a couple as a whole personality that is that has the man and the female counterpart. But you're not talking about that. You're talking about like actual actual physical evolution where you end up with physical evolution, mm -hmm. uh, in in great uh, distance in time, ten thousand years from now, when <clears throat> there will be uh, no more males and uh, our, our females uh, separated, but the individ the living, the people who live, uh, who are immortal, will be the androgynous mm -hmm. people who combine in themselves the whole of the male and the whole of the female. So that idea is, is part of what Solovyov is, is going for. And you wonder if there will even be separate individuals or whether we will mm -hmm. all be part of one great body mm -hmm. that's called humanity uh, or whether there will still be individual individual people with their individual lives uh, but that's somehow we will be we will be individual I think he says but we will also be part of one great body uh, of humanity. And so that will, somehow we will be, without any conflict, we will be both an individual and a part of this great humanity and feel, feel that way. We can recognize it intellectually now maybe, but to have that feeling as well, and for that to be what is dominant in our lives, this feeling of being uh, humanity, is, is part of what Solovyov is going for, I think. And while Fyodor accused him of just being vague and not taking, proposing any specific steps toward the unity of human life or of, of the world, at least Solovyov did try. He tried to unite, reunite the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. He was taught in conversations with uh, Bishop Strassmeyer, uh, and uh, in and through him uh, with the Pope to try to reunite the Orthodox and the Christian uh, uh, Orthodox and Catholic faiths. And so, this would have been an important step toward unity in Solovyov's system mm -hmm, and his mm -hmm. idea. But it, it didn't, didn't of course, work, and it just worked actually to his disadvantage. People back in Russia began to think that he had converted right. to Catholicism, that he was no longer a Russian. Fyodor himself wrote that in a letter that he 
So if you have converted to Catholicism, but uh, anyway, it uh, for his actions trying to achieve a kind of unity to work toward a kind of unity actually created a more disunity uh, among his friends and followers. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this and this was very frustrating to Solovyov, and his mood turned toward the end of his life. His last work. Uh, three conversations and uh, a note about the Antichrist take, shows a, a real frightening turn to his thought that the idea that maybe everything that I've been working for is, is, is wrong and it's not going to happen and this idea that uh, perhaps uh, that the Antichrist may be stronger more powerful than I imagined it to be. And in his poems, too, there's this sense of, of the demonic that seems to be rising. Uh, and he began to see, instead of the possibility of, of, great, of a future unity and the, uh, the idea of divine Sophia coming into his life, he began to write more about the presence of of demonic forces hmm. surrounding and the, the the things that he was struggling against instead of the things that he was he was struggling toward. It was it's a he became a kind of pessimist, uh, hmm. more pessimistic toward his, his life. Is there a, how do I phrase it? Uh, like concrete uh, dimension to these like with with uh, the more optimistic version of Solovyov uh, we can talk about these ideas what is going to happen how it's going to happen uh, there's like a, a narrative to it when it comes to these demonic forces or, or a darker vision of the world is there particular like developments in the social landscape or something that uh, he can point to as an expression of these demonic forces, or it's more uh, subjective, mystical, emotional part of... uh, I think in his biography, well, he he was uh, expelled from the university, from teaching in the university, after, in one of his lectures, he urged uh, the czar, czar... Uh, Alexander the third to uh, to forgive the assassins of Alexander the second and to uh, commute the sentence of uh, of hanging of uh, <clears throat> capital punishment to do away with capital punishment and for that he was attacked very severely and uh, not allowed to speak in public anymore, not allowed to uh, to give public lectures or to take a public position in a university anymore. Mm-hmm. So he lived hand to mouth for the rest of his mm-hmm. life. It was, a, it was a very difficult life. And he was a, an ascetic person anyway, very much like Fyodor. He didn't eat much, he didn't, uh, didn't uh, require, didn't have any possessions to amount to anything. And he lived with friends, uh, and visiting people uh, for the rest of his life, didn't have a home of his own. So uh, life was was difficult for him. And I think he was terribly worried about the coming of a war with with Asia, Mm -hmm. with uh, Chinese or with the Japanese, which actually did happen in 1905 after his death. He, he died in 1900. But he foresaw a rising power in the East, in Asia, that would be uh, an enemy of Russia and of everything that Solovyov believed. So he, he began to worry about that and to have visions of of the what he called he called it actually called it the yellow peril uh, so he began to have 
ideas of, of a rising Asia that would be an enemy of Russia and would be the end of the of Western, the Western world. Hmm. So, and the end of Christianity, or at least a, a threat, a severe threat to Christianity, including the ideal Christianity that he had in mind. So I think a lot of things of biographically and in history and society began to to worry him. Right. Okay. Um, I want to... The idea of... Uh, mm -hmm, go ahead. Well, finish what you wanted to say. That I think his earlier works, The Meaning of Love and... Uh, the, his his earlier works are what are what I I consider and most people consider the real soul of Yov mm -hmm. is a great contribution, and that his later works um, are kind of a it's sort of like the late later works of Tolstoy, kind mm -hmm. of a, a swerving from from what he had done so mm -hmm. well in the past. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um... I wanted to uh, have another quick uh, stop at this idea of um, of this utopian uh, world as it ought to be. Uh, another kind of step of understanding what it might mean. Uh, would it make sense uh, to say that this vision of mankind that he has uh, united and androgynous could it be applied to like humanity at large in the same way like like we know that a human body uh is not one entity right we have all kinds of bacteria uh, that that actually are responsible for our digestion uh on on different levels you can see uh, you can like point to individuals within our own body which we don't you know, the way we experience reality, we, I'm not aware of what my bacteria is doing, but we are in this interplay and we make up uh, an entity th th that is me. Is the, the, the vision of humanity uh, down the road that kind of vision? So we retain the individuals, but we perceive the world instead of uh, through our, our, our individual sort of uh, perspectives, we become the mm -hmm. super organism that in that sense becomes yep. androgynous because it has the females and the males within it but the the planet itself is governed or whatever uh, guided by humans is not any more of one sex yeah maybe i think that that's a good way to look at it too and that the uh the earth as being or the the civilization as being now totally filled with the uh, sense of divine Sophia, of the great feminine ideal. Uh, sometimes in his poems, uh, it is, she's presented as the world soul, other times as uh, Isis, as the, uh, the queen of heaven, and so forth, but a great a feminine ideal that as a poet, he stands on the shore sensing divine Sophia uh, on the other shore, mm -hmm. and he's calling to her, wants, him, wants her to come and into his life and to fill his life with her qualities, whatever they are, soul or something. And I think that this is part of what he's, he's talking about, too, is the idea of all of matter becoming filled with spirit, mm -hmm. with Holy Spirit. And so the world then, uh, all humanity, would be filled with, with the divine spirit, with immortality, with the divine spirit. Uh, so that's another way of looking at everything being now interpenetrable instead of being impenetrable, of uh, the exchange between matter and spirit, the things that are united together instead of excluding each other. 
is that connected to this i'm hoping this is this is going to make sense as a segue to uh resurrection and the his vision of jesus christ uh, he has this uh, little passage where he says he points to the difference between um, Christ after resurrection and uh, uh, immortal spirit. He says that when Christ uh, appeared to his followers, there's like this whole interaction between them where he says, "Look, I'm eating." You know, this is I'm 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 actually here. I'm a hu I, it's a human body. This is not an illusion, and this is not like a a, a vision. I'm physically here. Spirits don't eat food, and I'm doing that right now. So is I I, I actually you know honestly don't fully grasp that, but Christ. I, I, I never understood that in, 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 in the New Testament because then he, he appears and then he is nowhere to be found again. There's This is not the, like the, the resurrection that Fyodorov is talking about where everybody stays and everybody's engaging yeah. in this in this whole situation. The the way so so Solovyov has this vision of Christ. He says that um, he's the first one to defeat death. But it's just he yes. was the first one. It, it's not. It, this doesn't end with him. And, and 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 the appearance of Christ to him as as much of a miracle as appearance of intelligence uh, within yes. animals, and then before that appearance of life on a, from non living matter. It is like yes. you have this big process that the world uh, is undergoing and there are these stages that we consider miraculous because suddenly there's life suddenly there's intelligence and then suddenly there is christ who defeats death but the way he defeats so he's he's emphasizing the way he defeats death and i don't fully understand uh what he's trying to say there and and what the nature of this um christ resurrected uh, entity is what is the the importance of him being in a physical body as opposed to you know he's just living as a spirit he's, he's in, his identity intelligence whatever is not gone but why why the the connection between the physical body and the spirit is so important in <clears throat> dostoevsky's letter to fyodorov or to uh, peterson after reading Fyodorov's ideas, he said that Solovyov and I, like your thinker, like your anonymous thinker, believe not in some kind of uh, ethereal resurrection or totally spiritual, but we believe that there will be, that there, we will be resurrected in the body, mm -hmm. in bodies. So this is, part of their understanding of scripture of the new testament that the resurrection will be in bodies of some kind and so this is i think this is solovyov's attempt to explain how we can have how we can the resurrectors resurrected people can be in bodies and not just spirits is that uh, like christ in the Gospels, during the time uh, between his crucifixion or his resurrection and his ascension mm -hmm. into heaven. So mm -hmm. during those however many days it, it was uh, that he was on earth eating, visiting with his disciples and, and talking with them and saying, I am a human, I am a body, I'm not just a, an ethereal spirit, that that's how the resurrected people will be that's how uh how we will be in the resurrection now how this can come about and how you can be both a, 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 a an immortal spirit and a body mm -hmm. is great mystery and as a mystic we embrace that mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of rejecting it and so that that is, could be could be an illustration of the the different approaches between Fedorov and 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 Solovyov. Fedorov is not a mystic. Fedorov is very. He's not a, he's, 
he's a rationalist mm-hmm. in his own way. Yes, <laughs> uh, a, a logical rationalist. But Solovyov is a mystic, and there are things that that we uh, we can only embrace uh, in faith and not mm-hmm. take apart in reason. And so that's uh, part of Solovyov from the start. His 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 thesis on uh, against positivism, against the history of Western thought, and against positivism, uh, talks about how what the the fault of Western philosophy is that it doesn't come to terms proper terms with the unseen, with the spiritual. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now that's the strength of Russian philosophy for Solovyov, and the core of his own philosophy is that uh, there are mysteries that we can talk about and we can describe, but we can't come to terms with them fully in that in that way. Is there, uh, like if Christ is the model for human resurrection, does he stop at this uh, uh, resurrected body uh, stage or is ascension to heavens what awaits the the resurrected humans as well for him? I I would assume so, but I don't think it's specified. Uh-huh. Uh, I he he talks about the resurrection in a correspondence with Tolstoy, and says the difference between you and me, Lev Nikolaevich, is that you don't believe in the resurrection, and I do. Mm-hmm. That that's the, the the bone of contention between us. Otherwise, we agree on so many things, but it's the resurrection, Christ's resurrection, that that stands between us uh, as a in uh, as a bone of contention. And so he he keeps endorsing the idea of a revolution, but he doesn't specify exactly what will happen. He he tries to speculate, well, maybe it will be as the Gospels describe the state of Christ during that period between the resurrection and the ascension. That's probably what it will be. But he doesn't go on to say, then we will Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. will follow into an uh, ascension or what the final state will be. Uh, he doesn't try to go that far. I so don't he's think. basically not claiming like a, a, a full understanding of what's going on. He's just relaying the what he sort of intuits. He, he, what he, he intuits and what he points towards, mm-hmm. without trying to close close the uh, the deal. He's trying to point towards towards where he thinks, where he intuits as a mystic, where he intuits that it will go. Mm-hmm. But doesn't try to uh, to close it off and say it stops here and goes no farther. Okay, so we've been going at it for an hour and forty minutes. Let's stop at this mystery. Let's let's let the mystery just hang <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> listen, I, I've I've enjoyed this very much, and uh, if you're up to doing this sometime later, I would be uh, very happy to do so. Thank you very much. I certainly enjoyed it too. It's been a, a really good discussion, and uh, I, th- I really enjoyed it. And look forward to future conversations as well. Perfect. I'm, I'm happy about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, take care then. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.